was sleeping and in Egypt. <laughs> Questions? No running from the door right away. Yeah. Can much of Sandy said about other resource economies such as logging? Did you say logging? Such as lumber. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think, uh, I, I used to say this, and I, even though I've taught economic history, uh, I'm not sure it's true, but uh, I think the, the types of activities that we've been most, we've been engaged in the longest, we've, we've learned uh, to develop technologies that save us on labor and effort. So agriculture is the most spectacular example. You know, the depopulation of the Great Plains. You know, this population peaked in the uh, mid-1920s. Uh, and actually, in many of the rural counties has been declining since then. It's one of the more spectacular things. Steinbeck wrote about it uh, in an anti-technological sense, talking about the tractors that put out, put all these 40-acre farms on the Great Plains uh, uh, out of business. So I think, I think a lot of industries uh, have, have faced that same thing. And, and uh, uh, the lumber industry is, uh, Montana is also a lumber town, or lumber state, uh, also spectacular uh, going from, you have these competitions, I assume. Uh, Michigan Tech does too, where, you know, where people with uh, buck saws, you know, two-person saws, seeing who can get through the log the fastest, and who can cut down a, a pole the fastest with a double-bladed uh, axe. Going from that to the chainsaw uh, to uh, these feller bunchers uh, has just been amazing in terms of the reduction in the number of people who have to work in the woods. And our mills, uh, instead of being out where the forest is, our mills are increasingly near uh, large areas where there's a demand for wood products and where it's easy to hire workers and lay them off with much less, uh, less hassle. Those mills are incredibly automated. Um, uh, you know, my friends in the wood products industry is all, are always trying to convert me to a wonderful job they're doing by showing me their latest automated mill. Uh, and nobody's, nobody's pulling on the green chain anymore to stack the lumber. Uh, it's, it's, it's all done with, with robotics or automated equipment. So yes, that, uh, but m mining, it's just, so, it's just so spectacular. And then the, the unemployment in, in, in uh, mining dependent communities, you know, especially Appalachia, people don't move away when they lose their job. There, there's not, there's not the adjustment that takes place. Of course, that adjustment's hard on families and communities, etc. cetera. Uh, but not making the adjustment is also hard in terms of poverty and unemployment. Yeah. You haven't talked at all about the externalities of mining, the, the costs and maybe some benefits to uh, what's left when they leave. Uh, I can think of one benefit. Uh, the tailings that are around here have been ground up and the construction companies have used them in roads and so forth. But generally, the externalities are the big consideration in, in who mines have left. Well, that, I tried to, let me just say, I'm, for better, for worse, my family tells me for worse, I'm an economist, and so it's easier, easier for me professionally uh, to talk within my own field. Uh, but as I mentioned in passing, the environmental damage associated with mining uh, is significant and spectacular. Uh, uh, many people are comment on uh, the number of mine sites now that are visible from from space uh, because of because of their size. Health uh, costs? Well, on and on. Right. I, the the uh, 
My, my students in the earlier days of environmental economics, my graduate students were working on the, uh, the uh, health costs associated with the uh, sulfur emissions from the anaconda smokestacks, uh, uh, both impact on, on, on people and also impact on, on, on forests. And it, uh, it, it's major, and it's not, I mean, that was my point, it's not aesthetic. Uh, it, has, it has a very real impact on the ability uh, to develop economic activity after the mining is over, depending on the, the degree of, of contamination that, that, that one finds in the, in, in the area. So I, I'll leave to the uh, uh, hydrologists and, and water, water quality folks and uh, 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 air quality and, and people who study that, uh, one has to be careful about externalities. Uh, I don't know how many cities, unfortunately, use tailings uh, for streets, uh, use tailings for playgrounds, uh, only to find that they were badly contaminated and then had to go in and, and pull them out. In Libby, Montana, where they were uh, mining asbestos, uh, the, the waste products were used at, at the local high school track, in the playgrounds. Uh, uh, people could haul all they wanted to their backyards or front yards. Uh, and the result was that the entire city uh, was poisoned and is still dying. And that's, that's not an exaggeration at all. Uh, so uh, you got to be careful about uh, what we find out after the fact. Uh, but we know enough that uh, we, we ought to we ought to demand more than someone telling you this time will be different. Uh, that that that's what I mean, that's what my friends in the mining industry say is look we now have much stricter environmental laws uh, that what was legal in the past isn't legal now. And I, we're using a uh, technology that's closed cycle now. Uh, and what was done in the open now is going to be in a uh, uh, controlled environment. Uh, that's been said for a long time, over and over again. And I, I think one needs technologists, engineers, scientists to look closely and evaluate uh, whether this time will be different. We need, you know, we need some assurance uh, given failure over a very long period of time. Yep. I don't know if the rest of you heard that uh, the question. I, I think a legitimate one, important one is is uh, security of supply uh, for, for minerals uh, such as rare earth elements, which uh, it appears the Chinese have uh, increasing uh, uh, stranglehold on. Uh, I'm, again, unfortunately, I'm an economist. Uh, and economists, uh, are very skeptical of the idea that we're going to ultimately run out of or be without this mineral or that mineral. And I mean, the most recent example uh, is the uh, significant increase in, in production of, of uh, both petroleum and natural gas in the United States when people were uh, uh, projecting ongoing decline in dependence upon foreign foreign sources. Now all those ports that were going to be built to import natural gas, people want to build to market our natural gas at world prices, which makes me a little cynical about the national security implications. Uh, they, they talked about national security and energy independence. Uh, 
when it looked like we were too dependent on foreign sources. Once we had so much that it drove the prices down, then what they were telling was best for us was not to hang on to what we had and enjoy it, it's to export it. So we can all pay world prices for our natural gas uh, and the uh, uh, oil and natural gas people uh, can, can make more money. We've had strategic reserves of all sorts of different <coughs> metals, uh, including copper uh, and others for a long time, uh, and have never really had to uh, uh, draw on them, which is why we rarely, rarely talk about them anymore. Uh, uranium markets are uh, continue uh, uh, at relatively low levels. I, I, got, I, I gave up projecting. I used to project energy prices anyways uh, until I discovered that I was wrong every year and all I did was move my projection as to when natural gas prices were going to go up. Just move it over another year and another year. Uh, and after doing that for 10 years in a row, uh, decided I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm not, I'm not making projections, but when, when something is scarce and prices rise, that's, you know, that's the reason those copper prices fluctuate the way they do. Uh, when the prices are high, we bring all the resources that we have, we go to the lower grade, uh, or it's associated with existing mines. We go develop new mines, and not only do we do that, but everybody else around the world does that. And so uh, what was a shortage uh, with high prices becomes a glut with low prices, and so we shut down the higher cost parts of our mines or shut down our mines entirely, and communities suffer. Uh, so I, it, it's probably a fault of economists that, who think that high prices usually solve the problem of high prices by bringing on more supply or bringing on substitute goods. And I think that's happening to a certain extent with rare earth elements. Uh, much more interest in exploring uh, alternative sources of supply than uh, uh, we previously saw. Uh, uh, and I'm willing to admit that that may be wishful thinking on the part of economists. Uh, but the 20th century and into the 21st century certainly uh, have, has supported that, that we aren't running out. Uh, what we're doing is mining uh, lower and lower grade ores, but somehow doing it profitably. Things that no one uh, would have ever looked at in the past because it's such low grade ore. Uh, we now are mining on a regular basis. Uh, that's, that's been the response, uh, not, not a shortage, uh, but the development of, of technologies and substitutes, including you know, fiber optic cable replacing uh, all the copper that used to be strung all over our cities and countryside. I promise to be shorter. Yeah. A follow-up to that uh, a comment you made. I saw an interesting paper at an environmental history conference a couple of years ago who looked at that trend that you talked about of um, a resource looking like it's going to be depleted, the prices going up, and then new technologies uh, making it possible to access lower grade resources, etc. And so this guy was analyzing um, just some metal mines in world history and looked at how long it took to deplete the really uh, high-grade sources in the world, and then how long it has taken to uh, deplete medium-grade sources and uh, low-grade sources. And each time humanity takes that step, the, amount of, the, the length of time to deplete uh, that next step is much shorter. And so what he was suggesting is that even though it appears in the short term that there's always a promise that we'll find the next step that it looks like we're accelerating towards a time yeah, yeah. when we won't yeah. be able to do that any further. I wonder if you have a thought on but that. I, I think partly that's not uh, surprising. Uh, the, 
for instance, the resolution, proposed resolution line outside of Superior, Arizona, where there's a big uh, debate to try to get uh, Congress to engage in a land trade that uh, will transfer public lands to the mine, and the mine will give up lands, environmentally sensitive lands, they purposely purchased. Uh, so it's going to take national action. Uh, but their, uh, their projection, as is Pebble Mines, their projection of what it will take investment-wise to build this, the mine, is, is just astronomical. All up front, they have, they have to sink shafts now five or 6,000 feet. They then have to create two rooms uh, 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 above the, and below the, the, uh, the, the ore deposit. Uh, put in uh, all this conveyor system and, and, and crushing facilities underground. Uh, just enormous investments that will take a good part of a decade to put in place before a single dollar is returned. In that sort of setting, they, they have to produce quickly. I mean, they, 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 their discount rate has to be horrible at that point. They, they have to go, they have to then mine as quickly as they can. Or none of it makes sense at all. So that, I, I think, I think uh, the character, the shifting to increasing capital intensity is partly responsible for shortening the life of mines. The Butte operation has been going since the 1870s. It's still going. Uh, most modern mines don't last that long. I forget the uh, Copperwood had, is projected to have a 13 year life. Uh, uh, Lady Smith had a four year life. Uh, I, some of the mines just have amazingly short lives compared to what we're familiar with but White Pine had a you know, quite limited light uh, compared to some earlier uh, large compromise. So that I know that's the fear is that that optimism uh, what, that what's the parable of exponential growth although you know you have an exponential shrinkage uh, is that you don't know that your disaster is upon you you know until you know, half has been consumed, but then the rest is going to be consumed the next day or, you know, the next year or the next night or the next cost. So I'm, I may be being a naive uh, uh, economist, but in terms of decision making, I, that what we face and, the, you know, what we've experienced so far doesn't suggest that disaster is right around the corner. Way in the back. Your very last statement in the PowerPoint said something about uh, landscapes not being just a pretty playground, but being an economic asset or something like that. Can you say some more about that? Uh, yeah, but, uh, talk about that uh, much uh, to a certain extent that what's happening here. Uh, the, the typical assumption is that people have to go to where the jobs are. You know, that that's just hard economic facts of life. If you don't, uh, you have to be self-sufficient, uh, survivalist, uh, uh, off the grid, out of the, the market economy because you have no, no money to spend. And so the assumption is that, 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 that's, that that's what has to be done. And that means that the economy is largely driven by uh, export-oriented companies that are good enough to come to your community to take advantage of what natural resources you have for export. Uh, that assumes that people don't care where they, where they live. And from an economics point of view, that simply is an undefendable assumption. We care about everything else under the sun. Uh, just think about what our stores are full of, uh, grocery stores or electronic stores or whatever else, the range of choice that we face and uh, the way in which those preferences drive the economy. 
People do care where they live. And the fact that they do has changed the economic geography of the nation. The Sun Belt isn't a place where the sun is modern and exported. Uh, it, the Sun Belt is a place that has particular environmental characteristics associated with, uh, 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 with the climate. Uh, it's not just an aesthetic thing. Uh, it's changed dramatically uh, uh, where people have been choosing to live. A good part of the interior west, Thomas um, talked about the resettling of the inland west uh, during the uh, 1970s to, uh, through the 1990s. Uh, again, people making choices to live in small towns and small cities rather than large metropolises on the west coast or the industrial uh, 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 Midwest. Uh, so for, for areas to be competitive in attracting economic activity and workers at a reasonable cost, uh, for almost any area to be competitive, it has to present itself and have some sort of reality in that presentation as an attractive place to live and raise a family. Business owners care about that. Workers care about that. It's not the only thing they care about. Uh, they aren't going to go hungry over it, but they do, are willing to sacrifice income and potential employment opportunities a certain amount in the pursuit of a higher quality living environment. I don't know any demographer that projects uh, migration patterns anymore without including quality of life variables associated with different areas. Uh, it affects uh, people's decisions, and one would expect it to. I mean, if we care about you know, how many different types of organic or near-organic eggs are there in the coolers and supermarkets these days, some are just cage-free. Uh, some are, uh, yeah, free-roaming chickens. Uh, others are truly organic. Some are just natural. Uh, we care about all these, all these things, and then we repeat that throughout our lives. Uh, so why wouldn't we care about where we live? Uh, we do, and that affects uh, the location of economic activity in very significant ways. Almost lar all large urban areas now are competing with each other, bragging about the particular qualities of life associated with their urban area. They don't brag about their economic base. Nobody knows what the economic base of most large metropolitan areas is. They brag about their school quality, or the quality of their parks, or the safety of the city, or the amenities, cultural amenities associated with it. So there's nothing non-economic about quality. That's what the economy sells. Quality of homes, quality of food, quality of beer, uh, you name it. Uh, it's, it's the pursuit of quality that drives our expenditures. And it's the pursuit of quality uh, that has been significantly influencing where people choose to live and where businesses choose to, uh, to locate. So it's a serious economic aspect. It's not the only thing. It's not the dominant thing. Uh, but but one can't ignore it and talk about uh, the location of economic activity and regional economic development. We're going to take one more question and then we're going to break. You can chat with Tom and there's food outside. But uh, in back there, you had your hand up. Yes. You talk about taxes. I don't see our taxes for lumber that's going out or for the mining that has gone out. I hear that there are good things in the Minnesota Taconite about taxation that keeps a certain amount of money in the local community. Can you speak about that? Uh, yeah, I think that's somewhat uh, controversial. Uh, part, part of the uh, Taconite taxation uh, is earmarked for use within the Iron Range. And uh, for use in encouraging economic development with the iron, iron range. Now, it may have been that the original idea was that it would, should be used for encouraging diversification 
uh, or preparation for a post-mining or a smaller role of mining. Uh, but my understanding, and I haven't looked at this for six or seven years, my understanding is that a lot of it has gone to subsidizing new uh, taconite facilities being developed. So that the, the money flows from the mines to the government, uh, but then it's flowing back to the, to the mining operations. Not necessarily those that paid, paid it in already, but I mean, that, that's not a total, totally unreasonable thing if you, if you think there aren't, there isn't much alternative sources of employment. Uh, but it, I, I regularly tell my students that more of the same is not economic development. You know, but that, that gazing into the rear view mirror is not any safer for guiding the economy. It's not that you shouldn't have a rear view mirror, you shouldn't be familiar with your history, uh, but you should not be hypnotized by the rear view mirror as a dynamic economy is shooting uh, somewhere else. So, so I, I, I worry. I worry about that. I think what other states have done is set up trust uh, uh, accounts that the mining industry or the industry generating that revenue has no claim on, uh, and uh, often that only the interest on it can be spent. And the idea is to guarantee that when mining comes to an end, the state will have a fairly significant endowment to allow it to continue to support schools, highways, uh, police, fire departments, etc. So I, I think that's a better uh, uh, general fund approach than, than guiding the revenues uh, back to, the, to the, the single industry that I think you originally were trying to diversify away from. All right, thank you.